Section 5.2, the first law of thermodynamics. If you remember before, we mentioned that, that energy can be conserved. So conserved means the same amount of energy is at the end of something you're looking at as at the beginning. So if you're at the top of the hill and you have a certain amount of energy due to potential, potential energy, and then you go down the hill, you're losing potential energy because you don't have as much height but you're getting faster. You're gaining the energy due to speed, which is kinetic energy, and those can be interconverted. Um, you can also, uh, if you've ever gone to a roller coaster, know that you can't go down the hill and then up the hill to the same level. The second hill is always a little bit smaller because you're losing some of that energy to sound and light, um, sparks from the wheels, uh, heat because the wheels are heating up the track and that energy is not get backable it basically dumps into the environment and makes the air warmer or whatever so you can convert energy uh, the first law of thermodynamics states that you can't uh, destroy energy and you can't create energy either so if you can't destroy it and you can't uh, create it, then it's conserved. That's what conservation means. So the same amount of energy in the universe is constant, but you can convert one to another. So for instance, there's energy stored in the bonds of the material in stars, and then as that undergoes uh, huge uh, nuclear explosions in the stars, that energy is sent out as light and heat uh, that can then uh, be stored in plants, uh, then eaten by tigers and whatever. So you, you can change energy from energy to energy. You can uh, store energy in a battery that then is used to move a, a fan blade or whatever. So you can, you can change energy, but you can't destroy it or produce it. The internal energy of a system is all of the kinetic and potential energies in that system. So that's why it's called, it's the internal. And remember a system is, would be whatever you're studying at the moment, whatever you're looking at, that is the system. Whatever internal energy you've got, that is your, that is the total energy of the system, which is internal energy. Now, I don't know why this is scary to a lot of people. If you want to think of, the, of internal energy as just total energy, it makes it a lot easier rather than something that's mysterious. So if you were to say, have an energy at the beginning and the final state of the system has a lower energy, then you've lost energy to the surroundings. If you have more energy at the end than you did at the beginning, then energy must have come from the surroundings into your system. So, so you can uh, take a pot of, of water and put it on the stove and take energy from your surroundings from that stove and put it into the system and heat those water molecules up and make tea out of it. So if you're, if you're looking at the energy of a change, so you would say make some kind of a record of what the energy is before something happens like a chemical reaction and then uh, find out what the energy is at the end after the reaction, then you could determine what happened to the energy. Did, did, do you have more energy at the end than at the beginning? Do you have more energy at the beginning than at the end? As if, if you have a change in energy, then you find that change. Delta here, the Greek letter D looks like a triangle. Delta E, or change in energy, is whatever the final is minus the initial. So if the final is positive, or if the change in energy is positive, then you must have um, more energy at the end. Let's say you have 10 at the end and 5 at the, uh, at the initial. Well, 10 minus 5 is 5. That's positive, and so your delta E would be positive. If delta E means positive, that means you have more energy at the end than you did at the beginning. Well, where did that energy come from? from? It had to come from the surroundings. So energy came in, and that's called endergonic. The G-O-N is from the energy, and endo is inside. So it's coming into, energy is coming into the system. 
Uh, the other way around, if you were to have something like 5 at the end and a 10 at the initial, well, then you end up with a minus 5. And so if you have a minus 5, you've lost energy. And so you've lost energy to uh, the surroundings. And that would be exogonic. So your, your energy change has as much to do with the chemical reaction as the change in matter. So here's a bit of review. An, an endergonic uh, change is when you've got um, energy coming into the system. That means your final state is going to be bigger than your initial state. So your initial state's here in, in terms of energy and your final state's here in terms of energy. So energy had to come in from the outside in order to give your, in, your internal energy more. So the water in the teapot, now that it's been boiled, energy came in from the outside and now it's in the water molecules themselves. Likewise, an exergonic change is where it goes out of, ex exo like exit. So in, energy was inside the system and it went outside the system. So for instance, you um, have some iced tea, you put some ice in it, the heat energy that's in the water itself goes into the ice cubes, melts the ice cubes, and the energy then is spent uh, melting the ice cubes and that is an outward flow of energy. If the system was the water or the tea and the surroundings were the ice cubes, it went out of the T and into the ice cubes. So to review, if delta E is negative, so if delta E is negative, then uh, it lost energy. If delta E is positive, it gained energy. Now it's very important to not think of energy as only heat. Energy is not just temperature. Uh, you can have temperature coming in from the stove into the teapot and making the water hotter, and energy had to come in. That would be an, um, an endogonic, uh, endogonic system or change. But you can also do work on something, right? So, so just the energy is not always spent just on making something hotter. Energy can also be spent moving something. So, for instance, um, if you've ever seen a bridge and dri driven across a bridge, parts of the bridge are going to have these kind of jiggy-jaggy uh, parts that move together. So when the bridge gets hot on a hot day and lots of heat energy is coming from the sun and the steel expands, well, then these guys can expand away from each other, but you can still drive over it. Then when it gets cold, that, heat, that metal will shrink and as it shrinks, it's going to pull closer together and the bridge doesn't break. So if you build a bridge and don't give it way to move or breathe, if you want to think of it that way, then that will pull on the concrete and break it apart and you'll end up with potholes on your bridge. Old bridges always had potholes for that very reason. And um, because it's not just heat, it's not just change in temperature that energy does, but it's also work. Whole things can move as a result. In fact, your thermostat on the wall works because a metal is actually going to be moving away from a switch when it gets warmer and moving towards a switch when it gets colder, and that's what triggers the, change, the, the uh, heater going on or whatever. So if I increase the temperature of a system, so let's say I hear this is a system, and I do, um, I do heat on it, I've increased the energy, okay? The energy goes up. If I do work on it, the energy goes up. If I have a system and that system heats something else, like the tea heating the ice cubes, I've done work on that, the, the, the energy goes down. If, if I do work on something else, some part of the surroundings, if I do work, then the internal energy also goes down. So mathematically, the change of E is going to equal Q plus W. Q is heat and W is work. And positive 
if it's positive means um, it's flowing to the system so if heat if heat is if this Q is positive so positive Q then heat into the system if it's negative Q heat out of the system and it's the same with work positive W is is work done to the system which gives it more energy and negative W is work done to the surroundings by the system. Now I've already explained exergonic which means energy is leaving the system or, or endergonic ender, with energy is coming into the system. If you have um, only heat that's being uh, changing around there's a specific name for that and that instead of gonic for energy you would say thermic for for heat so endothermic endothermic would be more heat in the products okay which means energy heat energy has come into the the system and the products have more energy so the reactants would be here here energy wise and the products would be here energy wise so more heat the heat inside or the energy stored in the bonds of the reactants would be lower than the energy stored in the bonds of the product so heat had to come in in order to be stored in the products so if you have an endothermic reaction endothermic reaction then it's going to get colder so for instance the test tube gets cold why because the energy in the glass or in the air around the glass was robbed by the system in order to get that new energy that it needed it stole it from the environment stole it from the surroundings okay so you would have you'd have the surroundings bringing um, heat into the system that's endothermic if I were to have a bicycle at the top of the hill okay I don't care if you rode it to the top of the hill or whether you built it on the top of the hill or you you carried it in a car to the top of the hill and took it out of your car it doesn't really matter because that bicycle by the virtue of the fact that it's on the top of the hill has a certain amount of energy there's energy due to its position and I don't really care how it got there I simply record the amount of energy that I see so in the case of this water in the picture I've got room temperature water it doesn't really matter if it's room temperature it doesn't matter that it used to be boiling and it cooled down to room temperature and it doesn't really matter if it used to be ice and it melted into water and then rose to room temperature um, it, the path is unimportant so it's an independent of the path it's simply the internal system uh, the internal energy of a system how much energy do you see regardless of the path that you get there so it's such an obvious um, it's an obvious thing state functions that sometimes people get confused just because they don't know what the big deal is you just measure the amount of heat, uh, heat energy or work energy or total energy that you see uh, based uh, independent of the path it took to get there so for instance if I have an endothermic reaction where I've got reactants going to products and I go like this okay and I simply say I've somehow gone from here to here and and moved and more energy has been put into it here's the total amount of energy I have at the end here's the total amount I had at the beginning um, it doesn't matter or I could have gone like this and lost some energy and then gained some energy and got there it really doesn't matter what the path is I, I have a beginning and an end and that change that's the Delta E the Delta E is the energy um, of the final whatever this energy is 
divided by the energy of the initial, whatever this energy is. So who cares the path? It's a state function. So here's the, here's the important part of, of working with state functions. Energy is a state function. So if you have the beginning, the beginning of something and at the end of something, and you lost some energy by the battery, it doesn't really matter how you lost it. You see the amount of battery at the beginning, you see the amount of energy in the battery at the end, and this is the amount that was lost. But work and uh, heat are not state functions. So, for instance, if I'm running around the bases, I may run from home plate to first, second, third, and back to home, and in terms of a state function, I haven't moved. I'm still where I was started from. I, I started there and ended there, but in terms of work, I know that I've worked. I know that I've ran. I've, I'm tired at the end. So work is not a state function. Work is actually, can act, you know, you can tick down the amount of work you've done because you had to run all the way to first and then run all the way to second and run all the way to third and then back to second and then back to third and wherever you're running. But in terms of a state function of just lo looking at position, your position may not have changed, but you sure had to do some work. That's the idea, that a uh, state function is only a level like energy, but work, how much you heat something, or something, how much you cool something, are not state functions. So in, in fact, if you had to heat that water up to, a, to boiling, and then cool it back down to room temperature, your energy hasn't changed, but you had to heat that water, so the amount of heat had to change. So heat's, heat and work is not a state function, but the internal energy would be. When you're dealing with chemistry, normally work has to do with the idea of some kind of a gas pushing against the environment. Uh, so, so a gas pressure or a vapor pressure or something like that, or when something boils or when something doesn't. It's the work done by the system on the surroundings that determines when something boils or it doesn't. If there was no surroundings pushing that it had to push against, it would boil at zero degrees Celsius. But since there is a surroundings, you're going to have to do work and eventually it takes the energy up to 100 degrees Celsius in order for that water to come out as gas. So if it's pushing on something, there must be a pressure. And if it's pushing on something enough to make it move, there must be a change in volume. So the, the internal system's volume must get bigger. So a cloud is actually going to get bigger as it's pushing on the surroundings or it's gonna get smaller as the surroundings push on it and it will get smaller and, and more compact. So work uh, in chemistry is equal to a pressure volume work. So you have the, the drop in pressure times the change in uh, volume. So how much difference in volume is your gas, if you're talking about a gas, divided by the, the amount um, times the drop in pressure created that's creating that that volume difference.